my ladies. It's good to see you tonight. Welcome to the Lord's house. Stand to your feet. We'll open up in a word of prayer. It's good to be here and everybody see you. Well, I am proud of you, and let's just pray. God, thank you so much for the many blessings of life. Watch over every home and household that's here. Be with all our students and those working with them around campus tonight. Be with those not able to be with us, those with many prayer requests, and those also, oh God, that have lost loved ones in these recent days and weeks. Lord, we pray you administer to every heart and life. We commit this time to you tonight. Thy will be done. In Jesus' name we've prayed, and everybody say it. Amen. Remain standing as we sing a song. Let's start tonight with Have Thine Own Way. how I love Jesus.
be finding the book of Acts, chapter number 7. It is good to see you this evening as we look in God's holy word in Acts, chapter number 7. So, have you ever been asked a question you did not know the answer to? Have you ever been asked a question and gave an answer, but then you said, boy, I wish I could have given a different answer if you had it to do over. You see, that just described my entire school career. <laughs> I always knew the answer after I checked the answer key. But we don't always have an opportunity when it comes to life and what happens. In the moment that you have to make a decision, I jokingly told people that my next hire as a supervisor was going to be the supervisor of hindsight because everybody knew what decision we had to make, but they weren't around when it had to be made. And it's important we understand that we make decisions in life with the information we have at the time we have to make the decision with that information that we have, and we make it for those uh, reasons that are in the broader organization. In verse number one of chapter seven, I want you to see the high priest ask a man by the Bible's own recollection, full of the Holy Spirit, a question. And I want you to know that I believe that we need to be filled with the Holy Spirit to answer questions God's way. And I believe we need to get a better understanding of what that means. Filled with the Holy Spirit is not rooted in emotionalism. Now hear me very carefully. I want emotion in church. I want things to move me. I want things to move my heart and move my tears, but I don't want to live in emotionalism because, and I don't want my wife to because there's days I'm a better husband than I, other days. And on those days where I'm not so good, if we live in emotionalism instead of well-rooted in something, you know what she's going to say to me? Either buy or click. <laughs> All right? And she's a good shot. All right? So now we need to understand in a real sense we need to be filled with the Holy Spirit as we walk with the Lord daily. Remind you, filling up of the Holy Spirit is not something we should ask for more of. We are filled more with the Holy Spirit when we rid ourselves and God rids us of things in us that makes more room for him on the inside. So when we say we need more of the Holy Spirit, it is really not an accurate statement. What we really are saying is the Holy Spirit needs more of us. So when we look in God's word right there in verse number one, the high priest asks a Holy Spirit filled man, are these things so, now you are believers. If you're born again believer and you know that tonight, say amen. amen. Say it like you're excited about it. If you're born again believer, say amen. amen. Hey, that's great. Now listen, now watch this. We almost read the end of chapter six in such a way that we almost think it's funny that he's asking these questions or these accusations have come up. Because they are twisted, they are manipulated, they are falsified, they are exaggerated, and they're just not accurate. It sounds a whole lot like when a New Testament church somewhere in the contiguous United States, but not in East Tennessee, might have rumors going around. Would people really believe that? Yes. And you're looking around almost thinking, well, listen to how silly that is. And then the high priest looks at him and says, verse 1, are these things so, now let me ask you this. What would you tell someone if someone came to you tonight at the gas station after church, tomorrow at the cooler at work, uh, tomorrow night at the ball field when your kids are playing ball, and said, we heard the craziest thing. We heard that Jesus Christ proclaimed to be the Son of God, and when he came to this earth, because even most people that don't believe in Christ as Savior believe in him as a historical figure. But they said, we heard that Jesus came, lived a sinless life, died on a cross, and was penalized, although he had done nothing wrong. And we even heard somebody say that was to pay for your sins and for my sins. And then they buried him to get rid of him and washed their hands of everything. But three days later, he rose again. And you'd almost be thinking that they're acting a little silly. 
But what would you do if they said that and then they said to you, are these things so? You said affirmatively, you're saved tonight. That's great, and that's wonderful, and that's a blessing. But when people ask us questions of our certainty, can you answer this question, are these things so? Now, look what happens here in verse number one. You get a godly man, gets asked a question, are these things so? Now, we're going to hop down through some verses here. In verse number two, he begins to answer uh, this, and as he answers these things, I think it's important to note something. He is building a bridge between them. Do you know that we should not, we cannot win the world by being re uh, recluse in all our things? Now, listen, I only have this world to live in, but there's a difference between living in this world and being of this world. You see, we are to live in this world, and we're going to have, again, co-workers, our kids and, their, and the parents that we deal with are unchurched and those kind of things. We're going to have opportunities to see people, and we ought to live in such a way that they want to ask us the questions. What's the difference in you? What's going on in your life? Are these things so? And he begins to build a bridge with them by tying in things that are familiar with them. Look in verse number two. He mentions Abraham. Everybody say Abraham. One, two, three. And the things involved in Abraham's life there. And for the sake of not neglecting the scripture, we're going to read two or three or four verses at a time. And he said, Men, brethren, and fathers, hearken. The God of glory appeared into our father Abraham. Everybody say, Our. One, two, three. Our. See, he didn't say your father, he said, Our father. He's building a bridge with them to. Make sure they understand that if he can believe in this Jesus and those things, that they can as well. Notice what else it says. When he was in Mesopotamia before he dwelt in Quran or Sharon. Now look in verse 3. And said unto him, Get thee out of thy country and from thy kindred and come into the land which I shall show thee. Then came he out of the land of the Chaldeans and dwelt in Sharon. And from thence, when his father was dead, he removed him into this land wherein ye now dwell. Everybody see, he's building a bridge. If that makes sense, say amen. Wow. He's saying, I'm in this with you. He said, I know your history because your history is my history. And if I needed Jesus, you did too. When you get to the end of this text, what you're going to see is we realize that he recognized that Jesus was the Christ and they had not. That's our world today, isn't it? We're going to get to the end of our way. And some are going to recognize Christ as Savior, and some are not. Look what the Bible says here in verse number uh, 5. He gave him none inheritance in it. No, not so much as to set his foot on, yet he promised that he would give it to him for a possession and to his seed after him, when as yet he had no child. And God spake on this wise that his seed should sojourn in a strange land and that they should bring them into bondage and entreat them evil 400 years. Uh, may I say that Stephen knows the history of the Jewish people better than most of us know our own family tree. And he's building that bridge with them. Look what the Bible says. Uh, Verse 7, and the nation to whom they shall be in bondage will I judge, said God, and after that they shall come forth and serve me in this place. And he gave him the covenant of the circumcision, so Abraham begat Isaac. Everybody say Isaac. One, two, three. Again, he's building a bridge. He's saying, look here, boys, you all asked me all these questions back over at the end of chapter 6 when Stephen is brought before the council and they made these allegations. He is telling them, here's why I believe what I believe. Look in verse number 8. He said, and circumcised him the eighth day, and Isaac begat Jacob. Jacob, one, two, three. Jacob. Now we got Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. We well on our way to tracing the lineage of something important here. And it goes on and says, and, uh, and Jacob begat the 12 patriarchs. And the patriarchs moved with envy, sold Joseph. Everybody say Joseph, one, two, three, Joseph. into Egypt, but God was with him. Aren't you glad that even when you get sent or pulled or sent by somebody else or even in bondage in a foreign land, God may be in charge of that too. God was with him. Oh, that's so good. By the way, the story of Joseph is a wonderful, wonderful story, and we see so many parallels. Reminds you, everything before the cross in God's Word points to the cross. Everything since the cross points back to the cross. The cross is the central piece of human history, and it will remain such until the Lord comes back and establishes His earthly kingdom. If that makes sense, say amen. 
when we look here in God's Word, then we see something. In verse 9, Joseph gets on the scene. Verse 10, and delivered him out of all his afflictions. And Now, by the way, everybody see that? He delivered him out of the afflictions, but he didn't keep them from happening. Some of us have been really sick. Some of us have had sin problems, physical problems, emotional problems, marital problems, children problems, church problems. You know what that's called? Life. God didn't say he wouldn't have any afflictions, but he'll take care of them one day. Even if I have a physical ailment all the way into death, at death, through his holy word, he has delivered me from that affliction. When we look in God's word, it said he delivered him out of all his afflictions. And it says that he also gave him favor and wisdom. And that's important as well. In the uh, sight of Pharaoh, king of Egypt, and he made him governor over Egypt and all his house. Now there came a dearth over all the land of Egypt and Canaan and great affliction, and our fathers found no sustenance. But when Jacob heard that there was corn in Egypt, he sent out our fathers first. Catch that? Our fathers first. And at the second time, Joseph was made known to his brethren, and Joseph's kindred was made known unto Pharaoh. Then sent Joseph and called his father Jacob to him and all his kindred, three score and fifteen souls. So Jacob went down into Egypt and died he and our fathers and were carried over into Sychem and laid in the sepulcher that Abraham bought for a sum of money, the sons of Emor, the uh, father of Sychem. But when the time of the promise drew nigh, which God had sworn to Abraham, the people grew and multiplied in Egypt till another king arose, which knew not Joseph. By the way, I just gave you Genesis in a nutshell, and now we're about to jump into Exodus. Exodus, literally, a coming out. There was an exodus. And by the way, I believe God's planning a New Testament exodus. It's called the rapture of the church. And I'm looking forward to that. If that makes sense, say amen. Now look what it says right here uh, as we look in God's Word. Till another king arose. Now in verse number 19, it says, The same dealt subtly with our kindred, and evil entreated our fathers, so that they cast out their young children to the end they might not live by the way they got you got in a desperate situation there so oftentimes in the old testament the children of israel and even other cultures would sell would kill and even slaughter their own children you say my i'm glad we don't do that today i remind you we just had a supreme court ruling in which we were doing that to some 63 million over about a 40 year period When we think about that in God's holy word right here, we can see that these people had pain and hurt just like you and I have pain and hurt. And when he was cast out, Pharaoh's daughter took him up, verse 21, and nourished him for her own son. And Moses, everybody say Moses, one, two, three, was learned in all the wisdom of the Egyptians and was mighty in word and in deed. And when he was full 40 years old, it came into his heart to visit his brethren, the children of Israel. And seeing one of them suffer wrong, he defended him and avenged him that was oppressed and smote the Egyptian. For he supposed his brethren would have understood how that God by his hand would deliver them, but they understood not. Have you ever tried to do something in the name of the Lord and you thought for sure everybody would understand it, but nobody seemed to understand it? You know why? God gave you that burden. It is your job and my job to be obedient to what God tells us to do. Now, at the same time, he'll reveal that to who he needs to reveal it to on his time scale, not on ours. But we've all been disappointed. We've all been let down because we for sure thought everybody would just jump on that bandwagon, that idea we had at church, at home, at work. Nobody got on that bandwagon. You thought you were leading an initiative and you finally looked over your shoulder and nobody was following you. If you're out leading something and nobody's following you, you're not leading. That's called taking a walk. But you still go forward with the Lord if he told you to do it. Now, look what the Bible says here. The Bible is so filled with these truths that apply to our heart. When we look right here, he supposed his brethren would have understood. See, he supposed that. Now down in 26. And the next day he showed himself unto them as they strove and would have set them at one again, saying, Sirs, Ye are brethren, why do you wrong one to another? But he that did his neighbor wrong thrust him away, saying, Who made thee a ruler and a judge over us? Will thou kill me as thou didst did kill the Egyptian yesterday? Then fled Moses at his saying and was a stranger in the land of Medin, where he begat two sons. And let me just say this. The devil always wants to remind you of what you did yesterday. 
the devil always wants to remind you why you did that. Now, now hear me clearly. There are some things in New Testament Scripture that do indeed disqualify people from certain things. That's God's plan. That's God's design. And you're in a culture that that's not popular. Amen. Not popular. But that doesn't mean there's no place of service for the Christian that really wants to serve the Lord. But there are some things that disqualify you from certain things in a New Testament church. Uh, sometimes that's on gender lines. Sometimes that's on relational lines. Sometimes that's on conduct lines and all those kind of things. And listen, it is important to know this, though. So don't be guided in service by the lies of the devil. Stand on the authority of God's holy word. If that makes sense, say amen. amen. Now look what it says in verse number 30. And when 40 years were expired, there appeared to him in the wilderness at Mount Sinai an angel of the Lord in the name in a flame of fire in a bush. Moses saw it, he wondered at the sight, and as he drew near to behold it, the voice of the Lord came unto him, saying, I am the God of thy fathers, the God of Abraham, and the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. Moses trembled and durst not behold. Uh, by the way, let me just say this. You still with me? Say amen. amen. A good trembling when you read God's word would do us all a little good. When we hold God's word, that's where God speaks to us. We need to have a holy reverence for God's Word. We need to have a holy reverence for when it's spoken to us, when it's read to us, when we read it ourselves. We need to have a holy fear of God's holy Word. Because in the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Verse 30 and 3, Then said the Lord to him, Put off thy shoes from thy feet, for the place where thou standest is holy ground. Uh, by the way, let me just say this. God needs to decry, decry, uh, announce the land as holy, not me and you. you some, we sometimes make sacred places in our own minds and, and those kind of things. Sometimes it's in a church. I know that shocks you. Sometimes it's in a church. Sometimes we'll end up worshiping the furniture and everything else at church because it's holy. No, sometimes it's just old. It has fond memories. We bring back something that was special to us, but that don't make it holy. God makes it holy. When we look in the Bible right here, he tells him, put your shoes off because you're standing on holy ground. And Moses didn't have to say, now God, listen to me. I'm going to make this a holy ground and you need to observe it. It's the other way around. That's how we need to be. All right, now, when we think about that, we can understand Scripture a little bit deeper. Verse 34, he, uh, uh, I'm sorry, yes, I have seen, I have seen the affliction of my people which is in Egypt and I have heard their groaning and am come down to deliver them and now come, I will send thee into Egypt. Moses, whom they refused, saying, Who made thee a ruler and a judge? The same did God send to be a ruler and a deliverer. Now understand that. Just because the world rejects you, just because the world rejects you doesn't mean God didn't send you. Let's talk about the sower. Some fell on what? Rock, stony ground. Some fell on what? Good ground. Some fell on what? Thorns. Some fell on? And it burned up. One out of four. That's a 25% success rate. Based on the parable... I don't see where the seed that fell on the other three areas was any different than the seed that fell on the good soil. You see, the success rate of some churches is that number board. And that's not what really matters. Now, that number board reflects souls, and it ought to matter to us. If it, you know, but at the same time, there's going to be apostasy. There's going to be a falling away. And churches everywhere are not nearly as healthy as they think they are. One in four, 25%. Uh, my dear friends, that'd be people that said, hey, guess what? We can't call that old preacher to come to church. He only has a 25% success rate. The seed was good in all four examples. The conditions 
buried, reflecting the health of the soil. What I'm telling you is he has seen the affliction of his people, and he said, I've come down, and I will send thee into Egypt. And Moses says, and, or the text reminds us, that Moses has just been rejected by others because of his previous failures. I was talking to a pastor in the last few hours, actually, and there's a young man that went into the ministry in his first church, and it went south. May I say that churches need to do a better job of taking young ministers in the gospel and not bullying them, and they need to do a better job of just following this under-shepherd of the Lord Jesus Christ. And now he's questioning his call in that sense. And some of you may be grizzled up and say, well, if he's really called, he wouldn't question it. Well, until you've pastored a church and known what it's like to be stabbed in the back by everybody that goes there, then you don't need to throw that rock at that young man either. Do you know Junior Hill went on to, I, I, thousands, guys, how many? Thousands, tens of thousands probably made professions of faith through an old country preacher from Alabama. He, he died just a few weeks ago in his upper 80s. Do you know when he was in seminary at New Orleans, he was pastoring a church just a few ways up the road. You know what he did on a Sunday? He preached biblical truth. You know what it was about? If the gospel's good for anybody, it's got to be good for everybody. It was a church that did not let African Americans attend there. He preached that message on a Sunday. People came up to him after church and said, Pastor, thanks for sharing that message. That's God's word. That's true. Because either God died for everybody or how do you know he died for you? And he went back into town on that Saturday morning as was, you know, they drove back to campus where he was in seminary when he was a young man. And he came back to that campus, I mean, back to that town. And he went to the barber shop, and he sat down in the barber's chair, who was a member of that little church he was pastoring. And he said, well, preacher, did you hear what happened to you Wednesday? He said, no, I had no idea. What are you talking about? He said, they fired you. Hadn't even bothered to call him. He drove back up into the community that weekend and had to find out from a barber in the chair that he was fired from the first church he ever pastored. He said, there I was in seminary, embarrassed, and now it's my call to preach. And I was going to have to go back and tell all my classmates and professors, I've, I've been fired. Now, I don't know about you, but there's people back then, they don't exist today, <laughs> that they'd rather believe a lie than the truth. And when he, had, you know how that is, the devil would work on your mind just like it probably worked on his when he had to say, I preach God's word and they fired me, there'd be somebody that said, there has to be more to the story than that. There has to be more to the story than that. It really could have set him back. He had a choice to make, didn't he? Yeah. I'm going to walk away. This ain't going to work for me. Or maybe just taught him, God taught him early. This is hard. This ain't fun. This is not always enjoyable. Now, big boy, you're going to go on and preach or you're going to turn and go back? In John chapter 6, Jesus asked some followers that. He had a big, huge, massive. You know why? It's free bread day. But then he gave them difficult doctrine. And they even said, oh, this is hard for us to hear. And in John chapter 6 and verse 66, it says, and from that time, many walked with him no more. Wow. Now, catch this. And then he looked around at the others, his closest and said, you boys going too? You see, this ain't, this ain't easy. You're not easy is what I'm saying. Your job, not just mine, yours is not easy to go stand between two heathens at work. And I don't know who you work with, but I do. Right? That want to, at best, tolerate you. And at its worst, ridicule you, make fun of you. This one's talking about how drunk he's going to be on the weekend. And this one's talking about how many women he's conquered and you're in the middle of that day after day after day by the way junior hill just said i'm just going to go on and follow the lord and i believe there'll be thousands in heaven one day that said i heard junior hill preach a message but if he had quit that day i might not have heard that message those co-workers need us to stand up for jesus if that makes sense amen we go on to the bible right here and uh, i have no idea what verse we're in so we'll just pick one they're all good and everybody say it 
he brought them 36 out. After that, he had showed wonders and signs in the land of Egypt and in the Red Sea and in the wilderness 40 years. This is that Moses which said unto his children of Israel, A prophet shall the Lord your God raise up unto you of your brethren. Like unto me, him shall you hear. This is he that was in the church in the wilderness with the angel, which spake to him in the Mount Sinai and with our fathers who received the lively oracles to give unto us. In verse 39, To whom our fathers would not obey, but thrust him from them, and in their hearts turned back again into Egypt. Isn't that what happens in a New Testament church somewhere outside of Tennessee? We want to follow God till it gets uncomfortable. And the reality is, Amos says it best, woe to them that are at ease in the day of Zion. We like being comfortable. Now, don't get me wrong. I like being comfortable too. I will just continue, Ronnie, with the Junior Hill example. He, in that same message that I heard him give that illustration, he told a group of pastors, he said, I've been having nightmares lately. He said, I've woken up the last four or five nights in cold sweat, just couldn't sleep, almost in a pure panic attack. And he jokingly, yeah, those of you who never heard him now, he had a way to have you laughing one minute and crying the next. He said, yeah, I've been dreaming I was back in the pastorate. These two guys know what that means. Larry Gibby at home watching knows what that means. Brother Rick at home watching knows what that means. Hey, listen, we're, that's why in recent weeks, I think God's trying to warn us. Remember the other week we talked about being a soldier? This ain't supposed to be easy. It ain't supposed to be easy. It's not going to be easy. It's going to get harder and harder as the day of his return gets closer and closer. If that makes sense, say amen. In verse number 40, I'm going to hop down to 40. Aaron shows up. Everybody say, Aaron, one, two, three. Amen. Make us gods to go before us. You see, they wanted to go back to Egypt and gave up on God. Aaron, will you give us some gods? Sometimes that's how we are. Not we here, but other places, not in Tennessee. But, oh, give us our gods back, even at church, that make us feel warm, fuzzy, and comfortable. Hold on, I'm going to amen myself. Verse 41, and they made a calf in these days and offered sacrifice unto the idol and rejoiced in the works of their own lands. God turned and gave them up to worship the host. That simply phrase rendered out there really means he allowed them to do that. Got it? God don't want your worship or your service by force or by guilt. He wants it out of your love. Now, look in God's word right here. Uh, uh, the prophets, O ye house of Israel, have ye offered to me slain beasts and sacrifices by the space of 40 years in the wilderness? Yea, ye took up the tabernacle of Moloch and the star of your God, Rephom, figures which you made to worship them, and I will carry you away beyond Babylon. Our fathers had the tabernacle of witness in the wilderness as he had appointed, speaking unto Moses, that he should make it according to the fashion that he had seen, which also our fathers that came after brought in with Jesus into the possession of the Gentiles. Everybody say Jesus, one, two, three. Jesus. He's painted this whole picture to get to Jesus. Your life should paint a picture that leads people to Jesus. I once was lost, but now I'm found. I was empty, I was barren, I was convicted, I was doomed, I was destroyed, but Jesus showed up. Amen. Our lives should point people to Jesus. He gets Jesus on the scene here in verse 45. We see in verse 47, he mentions Solomon, but we're going to read this 45. Our fathers that came after brought in with Jesus into the possession of the Gentiles, whom God drave out before the face of our fathers until the days of David, who found favor before God and desired to find a tabernacle for the God of Jacob. But Solomon built him a house, howbeit the Most High dwelleth not in temples made with hands. He's about to break the news to him. You can go to a building and still miss Christ. You can go to a building and still miss God because the God that's on high doesn't really live in a building. He lives in the believer. When we look right here in God's word right here, it says, Heaven is my throne, earth is my footstool. What house will you build me, saith the Lord? Or what is the place of my rest? Uh, hath not my hand made all these things? I love it. 48, 49, and 50 are exaltation to the Lord. But then in verse number 51, we see the accusation. They tracking with him pretty good. 
It's almost like a bunch of Baptists going, uh-huh, that's right. We remember old Abraham. We remember old Jacob. We got Isaac. Yeah, hey, whoo, they're in our Hall of Fame. Hey, they're tracking. And then all of a sudden, preacher said something about the sin you're involved in. Notice he didn't say us anymore. He said you. You stiff-necked and uncircumcised in heart and ears. You always resist the Holy Ghost. As your fathers did, which, by the way, also gives us reference that the Holy Ghost was at work in the Old Testament. He said, by the way, you're acting just like our ancestors, but I have come to Christ, and ye have not. Now, if that makes sense, amen. In verse 52, you see, it says, you've slain him. You've slain him, which the prophets have not your fathers persecuted, all of them. They have slain them which showed before the coming of the just one. By the way, you don't have to wonder who that is because there's none good, no, not one. There's none just except Jesus. Of whom you been now the betrayers and murderers. I went back this week and I thought I was talking Listen, how many of you remember seeing The Passion of the Christ? You remember that was not in English? So you had to read it as you went? You remember that? I had it playing on my desk in here Monday or Tuesday while I was doing other things, and I listened to things in the background. And it still moved me to tears, and I wasn't even looking at the words, just glancing at the picture every now and then as I was doing other things. But I looked up just in time. Even when the world was about to let him go, the religious leaders yelled, crucify him. That's why he said, you stiff-necked people. You stopped listening. You don't see it, but you've done this. Remember back how this started, verse number 1. The priest said, are these things so? Now look in verse 14 of chapter 6. We have heard him say that this Jesus of Nazareth shall destroy this place and shall change the customs which Moses delivered us. You see, that's why he built a case all the way from Abraham to Jesus. And now he says very clearly in the text right here, in verse number 52, which the prophets, which of the prophets have not your fathers persecuted, and they have slain them which showed before the coming of the just one, of whom you have been now the betrayers and murderers who have received the law by the disposition of angels and have not kept it. Now, here's what he means. Not only are you not keeping the tenets of the law that were given by God, but you've missed the broader meaning of the law because Jesus said, I've not come to condemn the law, but to what? Fulfill the law. You missed it. Now, when we look in verse 54, when they heard these things, they rejoiced, celebrated, had a covered dish dinner. No, no. I knew I needed a different version. Let me. They were cut to the heart. I mean, nobody likes to be called a betrayer and a murderer, especially when you're on a position of influence that others may think less of you. He asked a public question. Now he's given a public answer. What Stephen has done is basically drawn a line in that proverbial sand and said, that's what you've done. Now, they've either got to fight or be seen in a different light forever. Look what the Bible says. But being full of the Holy Spirit, I mean 55, Holy Ghost, looking up steadfastly into heaven and saw the glory of God and Jesus standing on the right hand of God. See, the message invokes a response in verse 54. The response is they were cut to the heart. Now, I want you to look at all the actions here real quick. You still with me? Say amen. All the actions of the people, not right with God. Catch this. They were cut to the heart and they gnashed on them. Okay? He's upset. By the way, well, I won't say that. All right, now, how do you respond to conviction? Not here. Not here. Now, I, I pick on y'all. I think it's pretty clear when, I'm, when I say something about other places outside, and we're joking that all, we face all these things. But I do not mean this one for here that I know of. 
But I'm going to say this. Here's the cycle of the average Baptist church. Boy, we sure do need a good pastor. And they'll run the guy off and they'll get him a good pastor. About three years down the road, they'll say, boy, yeah, he's a good pastor, but he can't preach. We need us a good preacher. We need us a good preacher. About two years later, because you, you, you can stand pastoring longer than you can preaching. About two years later, you'll start saying, well, yeah, he's a good preacher, but he's run everybody off that preaching. Because he ain't down there daubing their foreheads and wiping off their tears when they have an ingrown toenail cut out. About three years later, oh, boy, that preacher, that pastor, he's a good one. We, we were really fortunate to get him. He saved the church, but we're starving for God's word because, man, he can't preach. Man, is that not right? That's a life of a lot of Baptist churches. You know why? Because people aren't staying focused on the book. Now, what's that have to do here? A lot of times when the preacher gets there, we don't know how to respond to conviction. And if we don't respond to conviction with confession and repentance, then what we'll end up doing is feeling like, well, then we're okay, then somebody else must be the problem. Right? Yeah. All right. I knew that. That's free. You're welcome. Bill Randall. All right, verse 57. Look how, what else it did? The reaction to the, of, the, of the crowd that asked the question. They were cut in heart. What else did they do? They gnashed with their teeth, verse 57. They cried out with a loud voice. Now, I mean, I got a vision in my mind. They growling. Yeah! How dare you say that? You not know who we are? We're charter members. That was free, too. They stopped their ears. I want you to catch this. Notice what it never is mentioned in this. They might have listened with their ears, but you don't get saved by just letting it stop right here. It needs to make a 17-inch passage down to your heart. Amen. But they stopped their ears. By the way, let's just be consistent with God's word. How will they hear unless there's a preacher? See, a preacher's supposed to be proclaiming, and then the people have to deal with the results. That's why it's important when you come on Wednesday night and on Sunday night and on Sunday morning, and everybody else does too, your soil needs to be in good condition to receive the seed that's thrown. Listen, I'm not responsible for your soil. I'm responsible to spread the seed. Now, if your soil needs fertilizer and water, we'll help you do that too. But you're responsible to help your soil be in a place that it can receive the seed. These people's heart were not. They want to catch them. They stopped their ears up. They ran up on him with one accord, the Bible says. I don't think they were picking him up and carrying him off the field triumphantly on their shoulders. Look what the Bible says. Not only did they cry out and stop listening and ran up on him, look in verse 58. They cast him out. Well, they had a business meeting, voted him out. No. They threw him out by force. By the way, don't ever say you're doing God's work in an ungodly way because God's consistent. He's the same. All right? Now, I'm not saying that we're doing that. I'm just saying I'm encouraging you. Don't ever say I'm doing God's will, but you're doing it in an ungodly way. If you're doing something that's against the Bible to get a godly result, that doesn't go together. If that makes sense, say amen. They cast him out of the city, and then they stoned him. That's what those people were doing. Let me, let me give you that list again. They were cut to the heart. They gnashed on him. They cried out. They stopped listening. They ran upon him. They cast him out of the place, and then they stoned him. Do you know I see each of those reactions after every message every week? Now, I don't get stoned physically, but you can see people dealing with conviction. When you don't deal with conviction the right way, you'll respond in a harsh way. If that makes sense, say amen. amen. Now let's look about God's man. In verse 2 through verse 53, he answered her question. The world's got questions on why we're a Christian. Do you know why you're a Christian? I dated a girl one time uh, uh, before I got married, just for clarity. <laughs> I asked her one time, I said, why are you Baptist? She looked at me like I had a third eye and said, well, because mom and dad are. Why are you a Christian? Now, your mom and dad might have had an influence on you, but you need to be able to answer the question, why did you choose Jesus? 
You need to be able to answer the question. Why did you get saved? You need to be able to answer the question when you're asked. He gives an answer. Now look in verse 55. I want you to look at God's man. We saw the result, uh, the actions of the, of the lost people there and the, uh, the answers there. He answers God's question. He's available to be a witness. Verses 2 through 53. Verse 50, by the way, if you answer most people as long as he answered them and they hang with you, there's a good chance they're going to get saved. <laughs> look in verse 55. God's man was full of the Holy Ghost. By the way, I don't think you need to wait till you're in the midst of a trial to get a fill up. Because I don't know if you know this or not, going down the interstate, it's when it flashes up 50 miles to E, 40 miles to E, 30 miles to E. All of the gas stations were raptured. They're gone. <laughs> fill up. Stay filled up so that when you get in a storm, you got enough. They were filled up. He was full of the Holy Ghost. Now, notice what else he did. He looked up. We need to look up to heaven. What are we going to do about this building prog project? I ain't looking in the offering plate. I ain't looking at you. We need to look up. What are we going to do about any problems we got in the church? I'm not going to hire a hit man. We're not going to have an argument. We're going to look up. Amen. What are we going to do about marital problem in a church? The couple needs to look up. What are we going to do about our kids that are wayward? We need to look up. Amen. From whence cometh our strength and our help? Amen. It comes from the Lord. They were, he was full of the Holy Spirit. He knew what direction to look. Let me tell you this. Now, don't tell him I said this. We pulled, he's, he's just 11 now. Caught driving the other day. This is a true story. Monday, I was taking him to ball practice. Elias sitting right there. We come to a stop sign. I said, anything coming? And I look at him, and he's looking my direction. <laughs> I said, hey, big guy, that's good, but if I pulled out right there, and there was some coming from your direction, we're deed. All right? We're dead. I said, I'm going to look this way. You look that way. You know what he said? Well, that makes sense. Amen. Right? You got to know what direction to look. Y'all remember the movie uh, there with Kirk Cameron a few years ago about the marital problems and all that kind of stuff. What was that movie called? There you go. You remember that? You know, they were having those marital problems, and he, in that one scene it says, I can just see her now. She's got her friends huddled up all around her, and they're all telling her what a low life I am and all that stuff. And it flipped to that scene, and sure enough, there she was. And all of them were patting her on the back, and she was crying and everything else. Sometimes when we're not where we need to be of the Lord, we strategically ask people that we know will tell us what we want to hear instead of what we need to hear. Right. We need to look the right direction, and looking up is a good way to look, and everybody see it. Amen. In verse number 59, we see something else. He cried out to God. Oh, God. By the way, sometimes that may be all you're able to muster. I need you. Right. He'll take it from there right. if you'll listen. We need to cry out to God and everybody say it. Amen. Number 60, he knelt down. Now, by the way, I'm not one of these that says you can't get saved unless you're in a certain position and all that kind of stuff. What I am telling you is this. If we can't bow the heart and we can't in humility cry out to God, God's not going to meet us in the midst of our pride right. to help us. Right. He knelt down. He kneeled down. Look in verse 60, something else. He forgave them. Now, I struggle with forgiveness sometimes. So I want you to hear me. The fact that he can forgive even while the transgression is going on says that he has a higher picture. You know, I believe because he's looking up and got his eyes on God, it doesn't really matter what's going on here. He said, forgive them. Some of us need to forgive some people. If that makes sense, say amen. amen. Look in verse 60 then. He just put it in the Lord's hands, and he fell asleep. I believe it was S.M. Lockridge that used to tell about people saying you need to learn how to die. You know, believe it or not, you don't have to learn a single thing. God will take care of that. What we need to work on is learning how to live with the Lord Jesus. Amen. Now, we need to be prepared to die, but we don't have to learn how to die. 
When he had said this, it said he fell asleep. Last one real quick. Look in verse 58. We've seen, I know I'm too long-winded tonight. No amens right there, I know. But God, God laid this whole thing on me this week. Amen. When you look right here in God's word in verse 58, I want you to look at somebody else. Saul is on the scene. Now, in every New Testament church I've pastored, this, Saul's been a member. So we need to pray that Saul gets saved. Because I want you to look. The, the unsaved folks there that asked the question, they did all those mean, horrible things and stoned him. God's man was given witness. He was filled with the Holy Spirit. He looked towards heaven. He knelt down. He prayed, and then he died. But look at Saul. Saul is standing there. What's he doing? He's a spectator to the sin. We don't need to be a spectator to the devil at work. We need... If you're a spectator and not trying to take up for God's people or you're not trying to intercede and help out and bail somebody out, and by bail out I mean help them in their greatest hour of need, then you may be an accomplice to sin. You see, Saul was standing there. Now look in chapter 8 and verse number 1. We might as well do chapters 8 and 9 while we're here. No, I'm kidding. Verse 1 says this. Saul was consenting unto his death. Do you know what that word literally means, consenting? He was pleased. He was pleased. Now listen, I've been wronged, Edgar, I, I, and, and, and I know that happened to all of you too. But I should still pray that whoever wronged me, I should forgive them and pray they get in a right relationship with the Lord. I should not be pleased when something bad happens to them. Because they need Jesus just like I needed Jesus. Saul was a spectator to sin. He was pleased with sin in verse number one. Also in verse number one, notice what else he was. He was a persecutor of righteousness. It says, and at that time there was a great persecution against the church which was at Jerusalem, and they were all scattered abroad throughout the regions of Judea and Samaria except the apostles. You see, he was part of the persecution of the righteous. And we don't need to be in this last day any question mark. There's no shades of gray or certainly not as many as people think. Let your yea be yea, and your nay be nay. Amen. Last one, then we're done. Look in verse 3. He started out as a spectator to sin. He was pleased with sin, had rain, and those Christians are, uh, were being killed. He was a persecutor of righteousness. And lastly, he was a <coughs> havoc reacher on the church and on believers. He made havoc of the church. I, I'm telling you, Saul's been in every church I've ever been in. He's there. And usually procreates. Can you say procreates from the pulpit? I didn't know. Compared to what I said two Easter's ago, or at least what it said online, amen. You see, we don't need to wreak havoc in the church. Sometimes you don't have to be lost to do that. You just have to be out of God's will. Look at these three things as we're done. And I mean that as we're done. I want to encourage you tonight. We don't need to be the angry mob. We don't need to be Saul. But we ought to replicate what a, God, a godly man filled with the Holy Spirit was able to do. Give testimony. Filled with the Holy Spirit. Looked up towards heaven. Cried out to God. Knelt down. Show forgiveness. And then die in the Lord Jesus Christ at perfect peace. If that makes sense, say amen. amen. Now we're going to get into Saul. One of the greatest miracles that we see in the Bible is when Saul becomes Christian or Paul, a Christian or Paul. The old song says, but the greatest miracle of all was when my Jesus saved me. Don't ever forget to praise him for saving your soul. We're going to go to the Lord in prayer in just a moment, and we're going tonight to have time of prayer, uh, and we'll end in our groups. I want to pray with you first. Let's pray. God, we thank you, and we pray thy will be done in every heart and life. We're thankful tonight that you can give us your holy word and teach us from it. So, Lord, we pray that you administer to every heart and every life. And, Lord, we pray that you would just help us to learn from your scripture. Lord, forgive uh, me for anything I missed tonight. I've done my best to share what you laid on my heart. And, Lord, I pray you would help us to not only learn the scripture, but apply it to our lives, our homes, our families, and to Nachi Creek Baptist Church. Be with those listening. 
around in the multiple states that watch our services each week and our own church family here in the community that's not able to be with us. And some are traveling, some are shut in. Be with the families that have lost loved ones. Lord, I pray if anyone here needs to know you as Savior, that they'd cry out to you this very moment. And Lord, that they'd find one of these other believers if they need help to pray with here in these next few short moments of time. We give you praise, we give you glory, and we thank you. And it's in Jesus' name we've prayed. And everybody say it. Amen. Amen. Brother Ronnie, you get a group. All right. Pat, you get a group back there. Let's see. David, you got a group there. See if Craig might get saved. Amen. Doug, we'll get a group right here. Uh, Doug McKenzie's walked in back here. I've got another deacon over here. I'm looking for my deacon. Adam, <laughs> will you care to kind of go that way and get a group right there? And uh, let's just get in those groups right there and enjoy your time prayer. I want to give you two or three things before you leave, though. One, we are partnering with Second Harvest Food Bank. We are going to be a food distribution site starting in June, uh, and we have very little to do with that other than provide a few volunteers to help. They do all that. It's all outside, but it takes up a massive amount of our parking lot and those things. But what an opportunity to hand out tracks, maybe even give a cold glass of water. The first one's like on June 27th. I'm pretty sure there won't be a cold front coming through. Uh, but it's an opportunity to let this community know uh, we love them Amen. and Jesus needs them. So we're going to be calling on some volunteers for that. Uh, also, I want to let you know choir will be practicing here in just a moment. Sunday night, 6 o'clock, uh, our evening service, there will be a baptismal service with at least two candidates that I'm aware of. Uh, and uh, so we're looking forward to that. And then uh, Iowa mission trips, we're going to leave on Saturday, July 13th, come back Thursday, July 18th. Uh, we have uh, four or five commitments on that. We really need to get that up to about 10 or 12. So pray about that, but we really need to make that decision pretty quickly. Iowa needs to know so they can make uh, some arrangements. Uh, and uh, so if that Lord lays that on your heart, here's what it is. We're going to go out on Saturday. On Sunday, we have, you know, church and, uh, at, the, at the host church. Monday morning, Tuesday morning, Wednesday morning, we do a VBS for about 20 kids, three classes, about 20 kids. In the afternoon, there may be some light type construction work or different projects that they may have ask us to work on, but that's very light. Just hand tools is all that would be needed, and we'll know more as we get a little closer. And then each night, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, there's three nights of a revival, and Brother Tony will be preaching that. Brother Tony Rutherford will be preaching that. Thursday morning, we get up and, and make our way home. So that's what that is. I have some information down here at my pew when you're through praying. If we could, uh, uh, anybody wants that information, I've got a handout and, and those kind of things, but uh, if you feel led to do that, uh, please, please pray about that, and we'll try to get involved in that a little more uh, consistently going forward. So I love you. I'm proud of you. May the Lord richly bless you. Uh, find these deacons, and let's uh, spend as much time in prayer as you would like. As your group finishes, please, please just kind of slip out while the others are finishing in prayer, and choir practice will start here in just a few minutes. May the Lord bless you. God's good. When? Have a great night.